So welcome to Thinking West, I'm Christian Tay. I wanna talk about the great books of Christianity. Now this is really gonna be a series of videos uh, since there's just so many to talk about and of course I'm gonna offend someone by leaving out something. Um, but generally, you know, pick out 10 great books of Christianity per three periods uh, of which we'll talk about. So the first period that I wanna talk about is the early church in this video. And then the next two videos will be uh, one on the medieval period and one on kind of the Renaissance to modern day era. Um, but you know, perhaps no other topic has been written about more in the West than Christianity. In the past 2,000 years, tomes on the faith have been written by kings, monks, prophets, and laymen alike. One might conclude that no other faith has inspired and been inspired by great literature quite like Christianity. Uh, therefore, in our, this next few videos, I want to talk about um, the highlights of the great books in these three different periods on uh, Christian works. And these works were largely written to lead and inspire the faithful through practical applications of um, teachings or by theological and philosophical exploration of Christianity's mysteries. So in this video, we're going to focus on years 0 to 600 AD to investigate the earliest Christian works. Let's start with the most obvious one at number one, which is the Bible. Okay. I don't really want to say much about this since everyone probably knows at least something about the Bible. But you know, in the Bible, it the word itself comes from Latin Biblia, which literally just means the book. So a lot of times, you know, in I like liken it to uh, in some early Christian writings they call Christianity itself the way, um, which actually has you know kind of an Eastern uh, feel to it, um, just from a lot of the movies and things we've seen. But uh, in here, the 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 Bible really just means the book. It is the thing, the writings of which we base our our faith on. Um, it generally consists of, you know, the Old Testament going back through Jewish history, prophecy, and poetry, and the New Testament focused on the life of Christ and then the birth of the early church um, with the apostles, and then it all uh, grows from there through, through the various cities, and so it's, the, the New Testament really describes some of the early history of the church there, as well as many of its core teachings, of course. Um, now, of course, the Bible is central to Christianity, it's thought to be the divine word of God. And the current canon of books, um, a lot of people don't really think about this, but the first, you know, the, the actual Bible as we know it today really didn't come together as, a, as one book, as the Biblia, uh, until the 4th century through various councils, one of which was the Council of Rome in 382, the Council of Hippo in 393, and the Council of Car Carthage in uh, 397. So, you know, it really took... Um, almost 400 years for the Bible to uh, develop uh, as we read it today. And, of course, there are some minor things that have happened um, along the way since then, different translations and things like that, but largely its form was set uh, at those councils. The second work is a very early work, 1st century AD, by an anonymous writer, and uh, pardon my pronunciation because I really don't know how to say it, but it's uh, generally called the, the Didache, or I've heard of, you know, some people say it different ways, but that's how I'm going to say it. Now, it's a brief discourse written in the first century that contains ca ca catechetical, meaning teaching or information of, um, you know, uh, is, is meant, meaning its, its point was to teach, it's catechesis, to teach. Um, but it contains catechetical, ethical, or, and ritualistic teachings of the early church. It detailed instructions on the rites of baptism and the Eucharist, as well as fasting practices and the complete Lord's Prayer uh, are contained within. Most people are at least familiar with the, the Lord's Prayer, which a lot of people refer to as Our Father. Now in one section, the Didache reflects on two divergent paths, the way of life and the way of death which reminds the reader to bear the whole yoke of the Lord and to avoid certain vices. In the section on baptism, the author prescribes the well-known formula in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost to be recited as the person is immersed in living water when available. That's blessed water. If the water is not suitable for immersion, it may be poured three times on the person's head, which a lot of baptismal rites do today. This section is particularly fascinating because the rite described is so familiar to Christians today, uh, of course, I see that with my children uh, every time they get baptism, uh, baptized. Uh, and the document really affirms the formula used in baptism now is the same as those of the earliest Christians. Um, though mentioned as, uh, by early Christians as Eusebius, the Didache was lost to history until its rediscovery in 1883 by Greek Orthodox Metropolitan Briennios of Nicomedia. 
Um, so yeah, it was lost to history until uh, really fairly recently. Number three, a shepherd of Hermas, likely second century um, in a place called Hermas or Hermas. The Shepherd of Hermas was a popular book among Christians in the first few centuries after Christ's death. Some church fathers, such as Irenaeus, even considered the work to be canonical scripture. Again, the Bible was formed slowly over time uh, and agreed upon through those three councils uh, that we talked about earlier. So this one, uh, Irenaeus, who is known to be a, a church uh, father, um, was considered, he, he thought it you know, might be part of the Bible, um, but ultimately was not uh, included there. But Hermas, uh, a freed slave living in the Roman Empire and brother to Pope Pius I, is thought to be the author, uh, though this is disputed, of course. Some have hy hypothesized that the author is the same Hermas that Paul re refers to in his uh, letter to the Romans. The book centers around several visions, commandments, and parables given to the author uh, to further the faithful's understanding of Christian ethics. In one interesting vision, the author sees a tower built of stones representing the church made up, up of its baptized members. An angel explains that the baptized can be cast out of the church if they commit grave sins, though they are admitted back after repentance, which mirrors a lot of uh, faith today. Uh, so several Christian denominations uh, kind of preach this, although not all do uh, by any means. The Shepherd is often compared to the more modern work, The Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan, a great read as well because it is believed to be the most allegorical while revealing uh, certain truths. It's definitely true of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, totally allegorical uh, and a fun read, and I recommend it to, to everyone. It's actually one of the first works I read that kind of launched this Thinking West project. All right, number four is called Church History, 4th Century Eusebius. Interesting that he wrote Church History when Church History was really quite young at this time. He had a lot less to write about, uh, one might argue. Uh, but Eusebius wrote church history in an attempt to chronicle the development of the early church from the time of the apostles until his time in the 4th century. As bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius had access to the library of Caesarea, a highly influential Christian library that housed over 30,000 texts. And this allowed him to really piece together a narrative of the early church through letters, martyr accounts, lists of bishops, and other documents. His work focused primarily on the following topics. One is the bishop's line of succession in the principal sees, notable Christian teachers, heresies, Jewish history, Christian relations with non-Christians, and martyrdoms. Now, the bishop's work contains many quotes from original sources that have since been lost, making church history a work of historical importance. Scholarly consensus divided over the accuracy of the work. Some critics have accused Eusebius of outright fabrication, while most modern scholars make a more nuanced case that Eusebius attempted his best with the limited resources at his disposal. Again, no internet in 4th century. Number five, on the incarnation, again in the 4th century, from Athanasius of Alexandria. The 4th century classic, On the Incarnation, was written by St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria as a defense of Christians' nature against various heresies that were prominent in the time. This was a big deal at the time. Um, the heresies that Athanasius was fighting against at this time really threatened uh, all of the West at the time, and it really wasn't clear if you lived in this time which one was going to win. The kind of more orthodox beliefs of Christianity that most hold today, or that of, of uh, the Arian heresies. Um, but Athanasius explains why God became man as a solution to what he calls the divine dilemma of man's fallen nature. He also expounds upon the nature of the Trinity and pushes back, like I said, against the Arian heresy that claims that Jesus had been created by God. This would uh, cause a theological issue with uh, how Christians believe Jesus is, um, Jesus' is relation to God now. Um, the work quotes scripture extensively while explaining the teachings of the early church. Now, the book has been hugely influential on Christian theology, uh, even until modern times. Um, and C.S. Lewis said of the work, quote, When I first opened the De Incarnation, pronunciation, I don't know, I don't know how he said that, I, I soon discovered by a very simple test that I was reading a masterpiece. All right, number six, Confessions, 400 AD, Augustine of Hippo. It's a work that we've written about multiple times uh, in a couple different articles on Thinking West for good reason. St. Augustine's autobiography has maintained a wide readership since it was first completed circa 400 AD. In the work, Augustine reflects on his sinful youth and eventual conversion to Christianity as he traversed the late Roman Empire. 
Augustine tells uh, it was, uh, of his time as a member uh, in, of the Manichaean religion, uh, which had uh, kind of more Eastern influences than, um, than, than Christianity. His profession uh, as a successful orator as well, the bloody spe spectacle of the gladiator games and struggles with chastity. His work features two other notable figures that played a role in his conversion and joined him in sainthood, Saint Monica, his mother, and Saint Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. He was in quite good company at the time. Who could, we could all wish for that. Now, in addition to his autobiography, Augustine includes his contemplati contemplations on theological and metaphysical topics in later chapters, such as the nature of time and various interpretations of the book of Genesis. Number seven, the city of God, early 5th century AD, by, again by St. Augustine of Hippo. Another of his classics, it, work, it really highlights his uh, intellect in full force. So, the city of God is a response to critics who suggested that the decline of Rome was brought about by the rise of Christianity. And this is a point that's still um, argued today, often by, uh, well, I wouldn't say today, but in, in more recent history by uh, Gibbon and his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He basically makes a, a similar argument that Christianity weakened Rome. Um, now, the work depicts uh, the human condition as a battleground between the earthly city and the city of God, and all of history as a war between God and the devil. The denizens of the earthly city are those that have given themselves over to the concerns and vices of the material world, while the citizens of the city of God are those who have given up the cares of this world in the hope of the next. Now, all people, cities, governments, and military forces, knowing or unknowingly, work toward the earthly city led by the devil, or toward the city of God, guided by God. Now, Augustine's work is considered one of the greatest theological works of all time and has been highly influential to Western philosophers and theologians throughout the centuries. Number eight, Sayings of the Desert Fathers, again around the 5th century AD. This one actually has various authors. Uh, it's a collection of texts, as, as it sounds like, uh, which describes various wisdom stories and maxims attributed to the Desert Fathers, who were some of the earliest hermits and ascetics living mostly in Egypt during the 5th century. Uh, during this time it is really the, the prime time for the ascetic movement uh, within the church. Most of the stories take the form of a conversation between a younger monk and a spiritual elder, or Abba, where the elder bestows wisdom to his counterpart. Now, early monks looked at these stories for inspiration and spiritual guidance, as many figures mentioned in the text are canonized saints like St. Saint Anthony the Great and St. Moses the Black. Early theologians like Jerome and Augustine were possibly influenced by the work as well. And many of the stories were originally oral traditions in the Coptic language, but were later written down in Greek. Number nine, the rule of St. Benedict in 516 AD by Benedict of Nursia. No other work has influenced monastic life as much as the rule of St. Benedict. St. Benedict of Nursia first formulated his guideline in 516. The rule has been followed by the Benedictine monks as well as other religious orders for 15 centuries. The work is really simply just a guidebook on how monks should live communally, uh, and Benedict's plan was intended as a moderate path between some of the extreme asceticism of solitary monks, like those of the Coptics, uh, that we just uh, talked about in the sayings of the Desert Fathers, and the more formal institutions of the church. So there was this wide gap, and uh, he really aimed to bridge that. This middle way emphasizes the practices of prayer and manual labor while maintaining a strong community among participants. Benedict modeled his, vi his vision of um, the ideal monastic life on the family, and though really uh, mainly written for monks, it's also relevant to religious women living under an abbess. This broad applicability helped to popularize the work as it could be used for a variety of communities. And since his work has been so highly influential and long-lasting, uh, Benedict is often credited with being the founder of Western monasticism itself, because he was just such a huge influence there. All right, last and certainly not least is Pastoral Care in 590 AD by Gregory the Great. So shortly after his papal inauguration in 590, Pope Gregory I penned Pastoral Care, a short exposition outlining the responsibilities of the clergy. The work focused on how parish priests could best manage their flock and the standards a priest should be held to. Critics pointed out that many of the moral intellectual standards Gregory espoused were unrealistic to the ordinary clergyman. Um, they are human after all. Despite this, the book proved to be hugely popular in both the East and West. Byzantine Emperor Maurice ordered that it should be distributed among the bishops within his empire. 
All right, with that, that's the 10 works that we picked out uh, to highlight in the first 600 years of Christianity. Again, there are many more one could choose. I'd be you know, glad to hear your suggestions in the comments below. If you want to read more uh, things like this, be sure to check out our website at thinkingwest.com. It's really our base for our, this, this uh, project that is uh, Thinking West to revive the great conversation, uh, to revive an interest in Western civilization and the roots of it and what makes it great and, free, and makes us all free today. And um, another place you should check out is uh, check out Thinking West on X or Twitter. Um, we've been growing surprisingly fast there, and uh, it'd be great if you can catch up with our posts there. As they they do, uh, you know, depart uh, significantly from some of the things we we post on here on a on a regular basis. Um, last but not least, be sure to like and subscribe. And uh, until next time, read on.